J.I. Packer, in his book, Abiding in Christ, writes this. Abide is an old English word for remain, stay steady, keep your position. What it means to abide in Christ, that is always to be resting on him, anchored to him, fixed in him, drawing from him, continually connected and in touch with him. There is no more precious lesson to learn, no more enriching link and bond to cherish, no more vital connection to keep snug and tight so that it never loosens than this. Abiding in Christ brings peace, joy, and love, answers to prayer, and fruitfulness in service. The abiding life is the abundant life. We're going to start a very short three-week series talking about abiding in Christ. What does that mean? What does that that look like? And in order to find answers to those questions, I think the best place to go is John chapter 15. And so we're going to do a deep dive into John chapter 15 over the next three weeks and talk about how we can know for sure whether or not we are actually abiding in Christ. Now, let me start with a sad truth, and I don't mean to be like a downer or anything to begin with, but I I think it needs to be said. And I want you to know that I say this with no judgment at all. I say this with as much love that I can muster from my heart, because I hope you realize this. That, that my main goal is, 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 yes, to be true to the word of God, but I want to help. I want to help you grow. I want to help you get to places in your relationship with the Lord that you've, you've either never been there before or you never thought you could go there. So in order to do that, we have to accept some hard realities. And here's a sad truth. Some Christians think that they are connected to Christ, but their lives don't reveal that. Some people may even think that they are abiding in Christ, but the lack of fruit in their life says otherwise. Now, we all can be connected. We all can abide in Christ. Thank goodness we're not talking about something that no one's going to be successful in doing. It's possible. And hopefully, if you don't know already, at the end of these three weeks, I hope you have a real good understanding and a real good game plan to help you know what abiding in Christ looks like, what those benefits are, and whether or not you truly are abiding in Christ. Because before one can be successful... With abiding in Christ, one has to know what that means. One has to know what that looks like. I mean, I could go to a mechanic, and the mechanic would say, Hey, Mr. Killen, and we're going we're gonna to do this, and then we're going to do this, and then we're going to come over here, and we're going to clean up this, and we're going to do all these things. And I'd be like, Man, that sounds great. What does that mean? I don't know what you're talking about. I, for as long as I can remember, I mean, my dad's been a or he was a mechanic for over 40 years, and every time I get on the phone with him, we're talking about, you know, our cars and our vehicles, and he's talking in a language that I just don't understand. I'm like, stop speaking in a foreign language, bro. I don't know what you're talking about. So we have to know what abiding in Christ actually means and what it looks like before we ever have the chance of knowing whether or not we are abiding in Christ. The passage of scripture we're going to look at today in John chapter 15, we're going to look at the first 11 verses in John chapter 15. And in these first 11 verses, we're going to see four results of someone who is abiding in Christ. If you have the desire to abide in Christ, these four things should be true in your life as well. So here's where we need to start. Number one, abiding in Christ begins by trusting Jesus as Lord. As Lord. Jesus Christ being Lord of your life is essential to abiding. 
If Jesus is not Lord of your life, abiding in Christ is impossible. It can't happen. It's not going to happen. Now, some of you may, may be thinking and, and have a little pushback. Be like, well, Craig, you know, I'm saved. You know, I'm a Christian. So, of course, Jesus is my Lord. Mm, not necessarily. You may be believing in Jesus to be your Savior, to forgive you of your sins, so that one day you're going to spend an eternity in heaven, which is a very important step to take, mind you. But that doesn't automatically make him your Lord. If he's your Lord, he's in control of everything. If he's your Lord, it's not you trying to get in the way and say, oh, yeah, this, but not this. No, if he's your Lord, you are saying, it's yours. My life is yours. So there's a difference. Jesus has to be Lord of your life for us to be able to abide in Christ. So the text starts this way in John chapter 15 and verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Now bear with me as we kind of stop as we go throughout this, these first 11 verses, but I just want everybody to always be on the same page as to what we're talking about here. Yes, this is the book of John, but John is not speaking. John is recording. John is recording the words of Jesus. Because most, if not all of your Bibles, in John chapter 15, the words are in red. So that means Jesus is speaking, John is recording. So it's Jesus who says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. What does the vine dresser do? The vine dresser was the farmer that tended to the vine to make sure that whatever needed to happen for the vine to produce what it needed to produce was taking place. So he was taking care of the vine. In the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament, Israel, God's chosen people were referred to as the vine. But as God's chosen people kind of fell away and they weren't producing what they were supposed to be producing, that name was taken away from them. They weren't referred to as the vine anymore. So then we get into the New Testament and Jesus comes on the scene and Jesus now says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. This I am statement, I am the true vine, is actually the seventh I am statement that Jesus makes in the book of John. Chapter 6, he says, I am the bread of life. Chapter 8, I am the light of the world. Chapter 10, I am the door of the sheep. Chapter 10 again, I am the good shepherd. Chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then here in chapter 15, I am the true vine. And what Jesus was trying to emphasize all throughout the gospel of John and all throughout the gospels was, hey, I am God. I am deity. I am the one who can provide for you. I am provider. I am sustainer. I am who you need the most in your life. So what that means is this. You do not and you cannot have meaning life if you're not connected to the vine. If you're not connected to Jesus. Now we can, we can do our very best to kind of go through the motions and, and, and do this or that. And sometimes, you know, we feel like, you know, life is pretty good. But I'm telling you, you cannot have meaningful life without being connected to the vine without being connected to Jesus. Verse 2, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, the vine dresser, takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Why? That it may bear more fruit. So the vine dresser, God, basically has two jobs, two tasks here in this passage of Scripture. For those branches who are not connected and they are not bearing fruit, he gathers them all together. And for those branches who are bearing fruit, at least some fruit, he prunes those branches. Why? So that those branches could produce more fruit. That's the responsibility of God, the vine dresser, in this story. Now, before we go any further, and I think you know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Does everyone know who the branches are in this story? We are. We who call ourselves Christians, 
We who call ourselves follower of, followers of Christ, we are the branches that are going to be referenced all throughout this story here today. He tells us that in verse 5, but I don't want to wait to verse 5. I want everybody to know now that we are the branches being referenced here in this story. Now let's go back to that word prune. Prune. Every branch that is connected and buried at least some fruit, he prunes. I don't know what your definition of prune is as a verb, okay? I I guarantee that everybody's got different thoughts in regards to that. Very simply put, it means to cut back, to take away. Why do you cut something back? So that it comes back in healthier, unless you're referencing the hair that I used to have back in my life, which didn't turn out very well, okay? But anyway, that's besides the point. Thank you for not laughing at me, all right? Some of you. We who call ourselves Christians, we are the branches. Jesus is the vine. God is the vine dresser in this story we're looking at today. Now, a lot of us, we kind of get confused because we think pruning is different than it really is. We think when God prunes that, you know, he's just going to take, you know, just like a little bit off over here, and you know what, you need to get rid of that, so I'll polish that up. And, and we think that God even like has to ask us permission before pruning us in our lives. It doesn't work that way, folks. If you think that God's going to prune you and you're going to get done with this process feeling like you just received a massage from God, you don't know pruning. Pruning hurts. It's uncomfortable. It's not fun at times, but it's necessary. Why? Because sometimes certain things have to be taken away from us in our life in order for us to be in the proper position to grow and produce the most. Now, just like the first service, and this thought just came into my head because I was looking at people in the first service who I wanted to make sure they, they weren't misunderstanding what I'm saying. Because I'm sure there's people even in this service where you've had something or someone taken away from you, and it hurt. And it hurt bad. And I'm not saying that those people are evil or those people needed to go or, you know, it's what was best for you. I'm not dare going to go there. But I do know this. Everything that God does in our life when it comes to pruning is for our benefit. We may not understand it. We may not see it. We may not even agree with it. But it really is for our benefit so that we can be more productive in our hearts and in our lives. Now, I think when we have that mindset, that's a much different and needed perspective when it comes to the difficulties in life. That you know that something may or may not be happening so that God can put you in a better place in the future. I mean, all throughout scripture, we see God is the shepherd and we are his sheep. We see God is king and we are his servants. We see God is the father and we are his children. God is creator. We are the creation. God is the head. We are the body. And so here, God is the vine dresser. Jesus is divine. And we are the branches. And sometimes branches need to be cut back. Sometimes branches need to be pruned. Why? so that we could bear even more fruit in the future. So my question is this. In fact, I have two. Do you want an abiding relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? The answer to that question is dependent upon the answer to this question. Is Jesus Christ Lord of your life? Is he Lord of your life? Not just Savior. Is he your Lord and Savior? Number two, another result, abiding in Christ will always bear fruit. How can we know if we're abiding in Christ? I mean, I mean, I think I am. I hope I am. I want to be. You know, how can I know for sure? It's simple. Your life is producing fruit. 
If your life is producing fruit, there's a real good chance that you are abiding in Christ. Verse 2 of John chapter 15 already told us that. If we're a true follower of Christ, we are bearing fruit. God occasionally prunes us so that we can bear more fruit. Now we get to verse 3, and some people are like, why is verse 3 there? That doesn't make any sense. Have you ever felt like that before? And it's okay if you have. You're not like an evil person. If you ever thought that you're reading through a passage of Scripture and you're like, why is that there? Like, that doesn't even make any sense. Like, help me understand, like, why verse 3 is in this passage of Scripture. Verse 3 reads this way. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. But what's that got to do with vines and branches and fruit and all that kind of stuff? Like, like, like that doesn't make any sense, but it actually does. You got to understand the context. When Jesus is speaking these words and John is recording this, this is the night that Jesus is betrayed by Judas. All 12 of his disciples have already been together and they've already shared a meal together. Jesus has already washed their feet, even Judas, the one who was going to betray him. They have already had the Lord's Supper. They've had communion with each other. And Judas has already left to go betray Jesus. So who's left? Jesus and the 11. And this is what Jesus says to those 11. All of you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. You know what that means? And this is a beautiful thing. This is a beautiful thing. When you place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are instantaneously clean. You are cleansed. That is amazing. That that is an awesome concept to try to imagine. Now, yes, you may still sin, and you may still see sin in your life, and yes, you may not be proud of of what you're doing and the decisions you're making and the choices you are making at one time or another, but you are still clean. You are clean. It means that God sees you and me through the lens of his son, Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And we are clean. You are pure. You are forgiven. You are adopted. You are loved. There is nothing that you can do to make God love you any more or less. God for that. You're clean. Now please understand this about abiding. We are not abiding in Christ so that God will love us, but because God already loves us, we have the desire to abide in Christ. So we got to make sure that the the process is right. When Jesus is Lord of your life, you're already clean. You You don't come to church to be made clean. You're already clean if you're in Christ. You come to church to worship God and to be reminded who you are in Christ and to be reminded of the benefits of living a life connected to Jesus. That's what we want to accomplish here. We have this this desire. Now, if you're trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then bearing fruit will be the evidence of such a thing. You'll bear fruit. What does it say in Matthew chapter 7? It tells us that you will know them, you will know the true followers of of Jesus. How? By their fruit. By the way they live their life. By what's being produced in their heart and life. So we're already clean because of the word that God has spoken to us. And then he says this in verse 4. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now this is the same thought and concept as, as Micah was preaching last week in regards to faith and works. We are not saved because of the fruit we bear, but because we're saved, we bear fruit. There's evidences. There, there's things in our life that people can see and know that we are followers of Jesus Christ. Let me say it this way. The only way we can bear fruit, there's not two ways, there's not five ways, there's not ten ways. The only way we can bear fruit is by being connected to the vine, is by being connected to Jesus. You you cannot bear fruit any other way. Now, some of you are visual learners, 
And that's great. So let me show you this. So when we, the branches, are not connected to the vine, Jesus, I don't care how much we try to convince ourselves otherwise, this is our life right here. That's who we are. But when we, the branches, are connected to the vine, this is who we are. This is our life. Now, somebody's like, well, Craig, uh, even that one in your hand is not officially connected to the vine anymore. I'm not going to drag a tree up in this mug, all right, just for this illustration, all right? I cut it off this morning from the back of the parking lot. Sorry, Jim, all right? So, you know what happens to even this one the longer it is disconnected from the vine? Looks like this. Now, here's the problem. Why does there always have to be a problem? Because we're humans. Here's the problem. And I say this with as much love as I can. I'm not not trying to judge you or where you are spiritually. But here's the problem. There are too many people who think their life resembles this. But in all reality, their life reveals this. That's a hard truth that that we've got to come to grips with and we've we've got to accept because as long as you feel as if you try to convince yourself that you're this even though you're this, well, this is never going to be healthy and this is never going to be any better. I'm only bringing things to people's attention to realize we've got to accept the fact that if we're disconnected from the vine, this is our life. And this is what we have to look forward to. We have to make sure that we are connected to the vine because the only way you and I can bear fruit is by being connected to Jesus, by being connected to the vine. Now, has anybody, and please no liars, okay, this is Sunday in the Lord's house, all right? If you lie to this, I hope you struggle taking a nap this afternoon, all right? So don't lie. But has anybody ever seen a a branch that wasn't connected to anything, that wasn't connected to a tree that was still producing fruit? Not it still had fruit on it, because if you cut it off, it's still going to have fruit until it dies. But, But you literally saw something that wasn't connected to anything else that was actively growing and producing fruit. Let me help you out. Let me answer for you. I don't think you have, because I don't think it's possible. Neither is it possible in our spiritual lives. We cannot produce spiritual fruit if we're not connected to the vine. We've got to be connected to Jesus. Now, a couple other thoughts about fruit. We cannot produce our own fruit. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the provider. He's the producer of the fruit. That's why he says in verses 5 and 6, and these are probably two of the most familiar verses in all of John chapter 15. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. So just so we're on the same page, real quick, help me out. Christians, apart from Christ, how much can we do? Nothing. Nothing. All right, 12 of us are connected, which is about seven more than the first service, all right? Just so we're on the same page here, okay? We cannot do anything. Now, this does not mean we cannot do anything in Christ. This does not mean that you can't still do something. Because anybody can do anything the ordinary, mundane things of life without being connected to Jesus. That's not hard. What it's saying here is that if you're not connected to to the vine, you can't do anything of spiritual value. You can't do anything of eternal value if you're not connected to the vine. We have to be connected. Now, some of you are like, man... Fruit? Why are you talking about fruit? Like, what, what, what's fruit? I mean, I know you just came off this 21-day sugar detox, three weeks of death, you know, that you, that you did with your wife and all, but, but what are you talking about with fruit? Right, write this verse down, and you can look it up later on your own. 
Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, if you're curious. But let me just summarize. We're talking about things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Does your life produce those things? Because if you're a Christian, if Jesus is the Lord of your life, if you're connected to the vine, your life will produce those things. So if you want to bear fruit, if you want to have fruit that lasts, if you want to have fruit that makes an eternal difference, if you want to experience the love of Christ, then abide in him. Then be connected in him. Then stay connected in him. I cannot find one example in Scripture in the New Testament where someone who is abiding in Christ and connecting in Christ is not producing fruit. You cannot find anyone that is connected to Jesus that isn't producing fruit. That is a telltale sign. When you're a believer, you're producing fruit. Sometimes you don't even know you're producing fruit until later when someone brings something to your attention and then you realize, oh, I guess I was producing fruit. You may not even know it, but you're still doing it. You're still producing fruit. Now, another quick word about this spiritual fruit. Who is the fruit for? Who's the fruit for? Have you ever seen an apple tree eat from its own fruit? Right? I'm hungry. Let me take a bite. No. Why? Because the fruit is for others. It's for someone else. It's to nourish them. It's to help them. It's to assist them. It's to encourage them. And let me also say this. Our fruit is not just there to be put on display either. Like, oh, man, look at me and all my fruit. You know, I'm pretty special. No, you're not. That's weird. If that's your mindset, if if fruit is on display for too long, what happens? It rots. It's no good. It's not meant to just be put on display. It's meant to help and nourish and encourage someone else along your faith journey. God bears the fruit in our lives to help nourish other people. I just want you to understand that apart from Jesus, we can't do anything Apart from Jesus, we can't help ourselves. And apart from Jesus, we can't help anybody else. We've got to be connected. Verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This verse is loved by so many Christians. (laughs) Because they think this verse is like a blank check. Well, the Bible said that, you know what, I can just ask for whatever I want to and God's going to give it to me. So, Lord, I want this, this. No. Can, Can you not... Ignore the first part of the verse. Because the only reason why the second part of the verse is true is if the first part of the verse is true. What's the first part? If you're abiding in Christ and his words are abiding in you, then he says, ask for whatever you want to and I'll give it to you. You know why? Because if we're abiding in Christ and his words are abiding in us, chances are we're going to want the same things for us that God wants for us. And so if what you're asking for is what God wants for you, Ask away. The answer is going to be yes. But you have to make sure that, you're, that we're doing the entire verse, not just claim and stake on the second part of it. Verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciple. So how is God glorified according to verse 8? God is glorified when we are abiding in his Son. When we are connected to his son. When we are connected to Jesus. Why? Because when God is glorified when we're abiding in his son, hopefully we are producing much fruit in our lives and other people see the fruit in our lives, wondering what that fruit is in our lives and we have an opportunity to tell them of who produces the fruit in our lives and then maybe they see the fact that, hey, I need that relationship, I need to be connected to Jesus and then it just continues to snowball into somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. And what's the end result? God is glorified. God is glorified when we are connected to his son. You think about this. 
if we are truly abiding in Christ, the evidence of that is going to be whether or not fruit is produced in our life. Fruit has to be produced. So let me ask you this as lovingly and as honestly as I can. Can others look at your life? Do they see fruit in your life? And know that you are a disciple of Christ. Not by, not by something that you verbalize or something you say, but just by looking at your life. Let me throw in another little wrench. Away from here on a Sunday morning, can people look at your life, see the fruit in your life, and know that you are connected to the vine? Know that you are connected to Jesus. There's a third result. Abiding in Christ expresses how much we desire God. Folks, if we truly are abiding in Christ, there will be a constant hunger and thirst for the things of God. More than anyone or anything else. Because you may say, well, yeah, Craig, I mean, I'm a Christian. Of course I hunger after God. And of course I thirst after God. Greater than anything else. Because if you're connected to the vine... You're going to desire God and the things of God more than anything else. Now, that doesn't change the fact that we all have guilt in our lives. We have times where there's shame and, and you know what, we just, we're, we're disappointed and we're discouraged and we can go to other people in our lives in those moments, but can I just remind you that nobody can do for you what God can. Nobody can ultimately give you what you want and need more than God can. It's God who saves. It's God who heals. It's God who restores. It's God who cares. If we're abiding in Christ, then the desire to be with God is our greatest desire that we possess. Do you want to know how you can know whether you're abiding in Christ or not? When being with God, spending time with God, worshiping God, serving God is not a chore. It's not something that you have to do, but it's something you get to do. Something you look forward to doing. That there's just that desire inside of you that isn't quenched from any other thing than being able to spend time with your Heavenly Father. Reading your Bible shouldn't be a chore. Praying to God other than when we want or need something shouldn't be a chore. Coming to the house of God to worship God and coming consistently shouldn't be a chore. It's something we should have the desire to do. And when we can't, something's off. Something's just not right. Our, our day's different. Our week's different. Why? Because we desire God greater than anything or anyone else. And when you are abiding in Christ, not only do you have the desire to serve God, but you have the desire to serve others. That doesn't come naturally. But when you're abiding in Christ, you have that desire. Verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. How did God the Father love Jesus? Perfectly. Unconditionally. Without limits. So that means just as God loved his Son perfectly and unconditionally without limits, that is exactly the same way that Jesus, the vine, loves us. Perfectly, unconditionally, without limits. That should encourage us. Folks, there is no one that loves you like Jesus. No one. There's no one that loves you like Jesus. Abiding in Christ is resting in the fact, having peace in the fact that Jesus Christ is loving you perfectly and unconditionally. And you rest in that. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Folks, if you're abiding in Christ, keeping the commandments of God is not burdensome. It's not a hassle. I'm not saying we always get it right, 
But it's not like, oh man, again? Oh, I don't want to do this. <laughs> that shouldn't be our expressions if we truly are abiding in Christ. Now let me ask you this. And I want you to seriously think about this. If we don't enjoy and if we don't want to be a part of the things of God on this side of heaven, why do you even want to go to heaven? I'm just saying. Because you do realize that in heaven, that's all we're going to be doing is the things of God. That's it. Nothing else. I'm not saying that, that anybody thinks this way, but I know there's probably a time in my life where I did. I don't want to go to heaven just because I don't want to go to hell. I, I don't want to go to heaven because, you know, one day, one day I'm going to get that glorified body. Praise Jesus. One day. I don't want to go to heaven because, you know, I've got a mansion waiting for me and this incredible food that might even contain sugar, yet you still have a glorified body. That's not why I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven because I want to be with Jesus. Period. Period. That's my desire. That needs to be our greatest desire. It's to do the things of God and spend time with God and worship God and serve God and serve other people. That is our desire. And then lastly, real quick, number four, abiding in Christ will result in an abundant joy. Look at verse 11. He wraps this section of verses up this way. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Now, before you start really concentrating on where you're about to go to lunch, okay, don't tune me out, all right? We're not talking about being happy here. Because I think we all know that happiness is based off of our happenings, our circumstances. And yes, even as the pastor of Bridgepoint Church, I'm not always happy. Not happy. Last weekend when my basement resembled an ocean, I wasn't happy. She'd be checking me in someplace if I was happy that that was happening. I wasn't happy, but you know what? I still had a joy in my heart that nobody can take away. Because there's not... Anybody or anything other than Jesus that gave me this joy? So nobody can take that joy away. Amen. Now, don't miss this in verse 11. He, does, he doesn't just say, you can have joy. What's the verse say? That my joy may be in you. Now, that's a whole nother level joy than just my joy when I have the joy of Jesus inside of me. He says, I'm telling you these things. These things have I spoken so that your joy may be full, and your joy can only be full if you're connected to the vine. If you're connected to Jesus. If you have that thriving, intimate relationship with the vine that is producing fruit in your life, then your joy can be full. Two weeks ago, we, we talked about the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippian church. And the verse real early in the book says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Now, please understand, just by reminder, Paul was on, under house arrest, chained to a Roman guard for 24 hours a day when he writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. How could Paul do that? Because he was abiding in Christ. He was connected to Jesus. And it was evident in the way he lived his life. Now, where does all this begin? If you want joy, if you want your joy to be full, then you have to abide in Christ. But before you can abide in Christ, you have to accept him as your Savior and Lord. You have to ask him. You have to invite him into your heart and life and make him your savior 
That's step one. Then you can work on the abiding thing that results in having your joy complete. Your joy full. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the encouragement in this passage of Scripture. I thank you for the truth of the Word of God. And God, I pray that as we enter into this time of invitation, that God, the Holy Spirit, would continue to do its work in the hearts and lives of everyone here or everyone who may be watching or listening to this online either today or at some point. And God, I pray that you would be the one to convince whoever needs to be convinced that all of this starts in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that relationship has to be decided upon by that individual. It has to be their choice and their doing of inviting you to be their Lord and Savior. God, I thank you for the fact that you make that available to everybody. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, if you're here this morning and you know you've been convinced in your heart throughout this whole message that there's a void in your life, there's an emptiness in your heart that can only be filled by Jesus, and there's never been that time in your life where you have invited Jesus to become your Lord and Savior and to be the forgiver of your sins, may I encourage you with what the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. So I want to encourage you, if that's you, wherever you are, I want to encourage you to have a conversation with God and say, God, I I need you. I need my sins forgiven. I want my sins forgiven. They, They can only be forgiven through your son, Jesus Christ. And so for the first time in my heart and in my life today, I'm inviting you to be my Lord and Savior. I need saved from my sins. I need saved from me. Thank you for saving me today. With your heads bowed and your eyes still closed, if you you had that conversation with God, if you prayed that prayer to God today, can, can I help you understand real quick that a prayer that someone repeats or prays just to do whatever is not what saves us. What saves us is when we believe in our heart that God did raise Jesus from the dead and we believe and we confess with our mouth that we are sinners in need of a Savior and that Savior is Jesus. And when that takes place in your heart and life, then and only then are you a child of God. And so if you did that today, we rejoice with you. We celebrate with you. Maybe you're here and you're a Christian and you're saved. But you're not really connected to Jesus as much as you want to be, need to be, hope to be. I hope that you would do whatever needs to be done on your part because you know God's going to be faithful on his part in order to strengthen that connection. I'm so glad. That no matter how many steps I take and I walk in the opposite direction of God, my Father, my Savior, all I have to do is turn around and take one step back in His direction. And He's right there like He never left me. Because He never leaves me. I'm the one who chose to walk away. So God, I pray that you would do a work in anyone's heart and life here that's reaching out to you. That's crying out to you. God, save people today. Bring people back into an abiding relationship with your son, Jesus Christ, today. May your will and way be done in each and every one of our hearts and lives. We ask all these things today. In Jesus' saving and holy and wonderful name, amen.